Hi, I'm Joe Honey Hockey, and welcome to the Heavenly Social, where I introduce you to our heavenly brothers and sisters. Do you enjoy beer? Enjoy brewing beer? Seeing, smelling, tasting beer? Then boy, howdy, have you tuned in to the right episode. I am going to introduce you to an old French bishop named Arnulf. Arnulf of Metz. Also commonly referred to as Arnold of Metz. Roll intro tune. St. Arnulf of Metz carries the great pleasure of bearing patronage over brewers and millers. His feast day is July 18th. And, fun fact, there happens to be another St. Arnold from France who is also a patron saint of brewers and millers. His name is St. Arnold of Soissons. But... We aren't talking about him today. Today, it's all about Arnulf of Metz. Arnulf lived in the 6th century and is a pre-congregation saint. For those unfamiliar with the term, it means that he was declared a saint before the current formal process of investigation, which started to take form in the 11th century. In 1634, Pope Urban VII issued a papal bull that stated only the Holy See had the authority to beatify and canonize. Before this formal process, it was up to the local bishop to review an individual's case and allow for their veneration. But this would only extend to his territory. Even back then, only the Pope could allow a saint to be venerated across the whole body of the church. Anyways, back to Arnulf. He was born somewhere around the year 580 or 582 in the Frankish realm of Austrasia, which included parts of modern-day northeast France, uh, significant parts of Germany, and almost all of Belgium. He was born into a noble family and excelled in his educational ventures. Now, as I researched Arnulf's life, it became abundantly clear that he was nestled in some fascinating family lines. Now, I should note that there is some uncertainty regarding aspects of his ancestral genealogy, such as the claim that he belongs to the Merovingian dynasty, the, the reason for this being conflicting sources. But what we are sure of is his descendants. Arnulf's great-grandson, Charles Martel, actually founded a new dynasty, the Carolingians, which eventually overthrew the Merovingian rule with help from the Pope, Pope Zachary. Okay, so here's where things get kind of crazy. So the monarch that brought this new dynasty to power was Charles Martel's son, Pepin the Short. Well, Pepin the Short had a son who became a legendary king. This king was none other than Charlemagne, the man who became the first recognized emperor to unite and rule Western Europe since the fall of the Roman Empire. That makes our friend St. Arnulf of Metz the thrice great-grandfather of Emperor Charlemagne. How cool is that? That was, frankly, too cool not to share. Anyways... Arnulf served the court of Theodebert II, who was king of Austrasia from 595 to 612. Arnulf was educated by a gentleman named Gondolf, which, as, as a fan of Lord of the Rings, was a little strange to say. Gondolf. 
<laughs> well, Gondolf himself was Bishop of Metz from about 591 to possibly 601, though this isn't really certain, and it happens that it's very probable that he was only a core bishop, which at the time simply means that, or simply meant that he was like an archpriest and not actually part of the sacramental order of bishops. Now, under the tutelage of Gondolf, Arnulf really distinguished himself in the king's court, and was eventually trusted with managing six provinces. In about 596, he was married to a noblewoman named Doda, and uh, together they had two sons, Claudolf and, oh goodness, and Sagasol. Yes. I want to take a moment and talk about these two. Claudolf eventually became the third successor of his father as Bishop of Metz, which is pretty friggin' cool. But uh, and Sagasol is the one who ties the descendants I mentioned earlier together. He married a gal named Bega, who is also actually venerated as a saint, and who was the daughter of a nobleman named Pepin of Landen. So it's from these two, and Segesel and Bega, that we get the lineage of the Carolingians. Now, I also want to share the fun fact that St. Bega is the older sister of St. Gertrude of Nivelle. I might do an episode on her in the future, uh, that being St. Gertrude, but I just wanted to share this to highlight how important it is to surround ourselves with other people striving for sainthood, because all of the saints' life stories, uh, at least that I've looked at thus far, find them crossing paths with other saints or other saintly people. So I just wanted to say that we can't do this alone. And historically, nobody has ever done this alone. Amidst all of Arnulf's courtly success, he remained deeply religious. In fact, he was planning a pilgrimage to the Cistercian Abbey of Larin with his friend Romericus. But it was at that time that he was offered the seat of Metz. His wife Doda, actually at that time, entered a convent at Treves, and so Arnulf entered the priesthood, and then accepting the ordination as Bishop of Metz. Uh, the year at this time was 614. Now, he took his responsibilities as bishop very seriously. But at that time, bishops also served as political figures. So he remained very much involved in the courts. It's in the following years that his life really kind of comes off as something from Game of Thrones what with all of the family politics and power grabs and, and whatnot. Arnulf as a bishop and tutor and advisor to a young Dagobert I, the then king of Austrasia, uh, actually encouraged him in the murder of a fellow named Crodald, who was the leader of a Frankish family. So, yeah... It was kind of intense. But even so, Arnulf is said to have been a good and virtuous leader. And according to one legend, the guilt of having a role in the wars and the murder uh, between the ruling families uh, weighed down on him. So he ended up taking his bishop's ring and he threw it into the Moselle River, begging God to return the ring to him as a sign of absolution. Well, years 
later, in 628, Arnulf's kitchen staff found his ring in the stomach of a fish that had been brought to them that day. Well, upon receiving his ring, and with it that sign of absolution he had asked for, he immediately declared his retirement as bishop. Now, the second legend states that upon this declaration, a fire broke out in the cellars of the royal palace. It goes on to say that Arnulf stood before the fire and said, If God wants me to be consumed, I am in his hands. Then he made the sign of the cross, and the fire receded. Upon retiring, Arnulf ventured to the Ramiramont Abbey in the Vosges mountain range with his friend Romericus, where he remained in prayerful contemplation until his death, which was somewhere between 643 and 647. Arnulf was so beloved that his successor, Bishop Garrick sent parishioners for Arnulf's remains to be transferred from the abbey to the cathedral at Metz. And here is where we get our third legend. The journey to retrieve his remains was difficult, as the mountains were inhospitable. So, on the return journey... To Metz, the parishioners found themselves running out of drink, so one of them prayed for Arnulf's intercession, that he would bring them what they lack. Immediately, the remnants of beer they had multiplied, and those in procession had enough to enjoy even the next evening when they returned to Metz, where Arnulf's remains were placed within the cathedral there. Now, looking back at any pre-congregation saint is always interesting, because they come from a time when oral tradition was most prominent, and as such, we have many extraordinary tales and legends that may or may not have actually happened. I think those belonging to Arnulf are relatively tame and actually very believable. But even in light of this, the church speaks with infallibility when declaring an individual a saint. So we can rest assured that if we ask help from someone in the church that, uh, that the church has recognized, then they'll certainly hear us. With that said, in looking at what we know about St. Arnulf's life, the virtue that stands out to me the most was his faith. In abandoning ourselves to God, we give him the space to act in our lives. And this, frankly, requires faith. It sure isn't easy, but that's what makes it a virtue. When we're weighed down by the things of the world, by circumstances, or by people, it's easy to get frustrated, especially when prayer doesn't appear to offer any answers or consolation. I certainly experience this often, and in those moments I find a level of comfort in stories like Arnulf's, where despite living a just life and striving to live according to God, he still experienced the weight of the world, and went through a time of penance lasting several years. I, I certainly hope that, <laughs> that I don't really experience several years of desolation, but yeah, I mean, we'll see. It's all according to God's will, right? But this highlights how important faith is in our journey. Because in those moments of desolation, or like I said, even years of desolation, it's only by having faith that God has a grander plan in mind that we're able to persevere. And to do this uh, requires a few ingredients. First, we need to humble ourselves. 
then we're free to trust God. And it's in this trust that we find faith. A faith well demonstrated by Arnulf in the stories that have now reached legendary status. So to wrap things up, I propose a prayer to our dear Saint Arnulf. And I can think of no better way to structure a prayer to a patron of beer than to make it something like a toast. Ahem. Saint Arnulf of Metz, patron of brewers and beer, to all who toil and celebrate, I ask you stay near, to guide their work and our play so that with God we may stay. And when we feel ourselves waver and falter, I beg you to move our faith back to the heavenly altar. Keep our glasses full and our spirits empty, so that one day we all may celebrate in the heavenly city. St. Arnulf of Metz, whose faith is pleasing to the Lord, pray for us. That does it for this episode. And remember to keep the faith, because one day someone may just tell your saint story. And outro tune! Uh, Such as the claim that he belongs to the... uh, Oh gosh. The Merovingian. Merovingian dynasty. Now, under the tutelage of Gondolf, Arnulf really distinguished... Oh my gosh. Upon retiring, Arnulf ventured to the Remiram. Oh my gosh. The Remiramont. That his success for... Oh my... Mm. Well, I may have just completely lost my marbles. Luckily... I have a good friend who can help me out with that. So stay tuned next time, and we'll talk about a saint who's very dear to me. And hopefully she might become very dear to you. See ya!